9 o'clock to about 11 o'clock on a Wednesday night to worship the Lord, and yet you're here. And so my prayer is this, is that tonight you would have an Ephraim moment. And what I mean by that, um, one of my favorite people in the Bible is Joseph in Genesis. And Joseph is sold by his brothers. He is bought by the uh, Ishmaelites. He is goes through all these Potiphar's house, and he's accused of rape. He's in prison. He's forgotten about Then He's pulled up to Pharaoh and um, he's made like the vice president of Egypt. And he's living in a place he still doesn't want to be, right? And most of the time when we read about his story, we're thinking, oh, he's got it made. He's the second guy. He's the VP, right? Like everything's going good. And yet there's still a desire for Joseph to go back home and to be with family because he's still a foreigner in a foreign land. And yet he is fruitful where he is. And he names his second son Ephraim. And it says, this, the Lord has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. And my prayer for you tonight is this, is that you may not like where you are in life right now. Man, college may be tough. Man, maybe there's some tough adjustments. Maybe there's some things going on that you don't think are fair that, that man, just been hard and you're tried and you're stressed and you're maxed out. And my prayer tonight is this, is that you have an Ephraim moment. You may not like where you are. You may be, it may be a hard time, but the Lord would make you fruitful where you are. And tonight I want to talk to you about dead dogs and awkward pictures. Dead dogs and awkward pictures. Um, the worst day of my life till I was about age 21 happened when I was 18 years old. Um, I, you'll, you'll see this later on in service, but I, I had a glow up by a long shot. Um, I was ugly in mid-high. It was not good. And um, I had a glow up about my junior, sophomore year in high school, and then about my senior year, girls all of a sudden started acting interested in me, and I was shocked because I was so ugly and I was so weird for so long that I thought it was a prank when the first girl liked me. And the first girl that kind of liked me and asked me out was a girl named Amber Rainey, and uh, the name just sounds sexy, right? And so um, Amber Rainey asked me uh, if, if I was interested in going on a date. Uh, it was kind of a younger sister of a friend, um, we were the same age, but she lived about two hours away, so it was a long-distance relationship, and um, I was horrible at relationships. The longest relationship I had before I met my wife was two and a half months. Like, I was just in and out. I was done, right? Like, I was just like, once it got boring or once it got clingy, I was like, I'm gone. Um, and so... Amber Rainey comes and um, we're hitting about the two month mark and we decide, I decide, hey, we're gonna go, um, go eat somewhere really fancy. So we went and ate at Olive Garden, right? Cause that was, that's fancy. Um, you got free appetizers, breadsticks. Hit, knock yourself out, girl, right? Like just have all the breadsticks and salad you want. And uh, you know, that never ending bowl is coming your way. And so, um, and we decided to go horseback riding. and. I, have no, I am not a horseback riding type person. I am not a cowboy. I am not. I, only time I was on a horse in my life up to this point was when I was five years old riding on a horse with my Meemaw, right? And so um, we go to this place, Dra Draper Lake in Oklahoma City, kind of Midwest City area. Anyways, and we go to this place and they're like, okay, we need to know, we need to know who's the expert rider of the bunch. I'm like, that would be me. Um, because I'm trying to impress Amber, right? I'm like, I'm still trying to impress her. And so um, he's like, okay, this will be your horse. And his name was Scout. Um, and I remember it because I remember that horse and I hope he's turned into glue by now. But, um, and then Amber and a bunch of people we didn't know. And I got on Scout and I get on this horse and they're like, okay, are you ready? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm ready. I got this, right? I'm like, I'm, for, I'm looking at Amber. I'm like, if you need anything, you just let me know. I'm here for you, girl, right? Like, I'm like, I got you. And the horse, when I get on, it just takes off as fast as it can run. Like, and it looks fun in the movies to be on a horse that's running fast. Can I tell you, it's the scariest moment of my entire life because all I can do is just scream like a little girl. I'm like, ah, <laughs> like that. And it's just, I'm gone. Like, I don't know where this horse is running. I don't know where we're going. 
and I am gone. Like, and I'm just like, I finally get the horse to stop. I'm broken out in a sweat. That horse won't go anywhere. It's just staying there. And they have to come get me in a truck, load the horse on a trailer and take us back. And it's the most humiliating part. We get back, um, we go to the Olive Garden all of a sudden. I've got a rash from the horse. I didn't know I was allergic to horses, but apparently I was in that moment. So I've got a rash that's breaking out all over my body. Amber looks at me and goes, you know, I just think we're probably done. And I'm like, girl, couldn't you have, you know we were done before I paid for Olive Garden a horse ride? Like, come on. Like, you just wanted a free meal. I got this. And my world was devastating that moment, right? Because first, like, this was the first normal, attractive girl that had asked me out, right? That was actually interested in me. And I remember going home. Good Lord. Um, I remember going home and I walk into the door and I had a 10 o'clock curfew all the way through college. Try that on. Um, all you freshmen complaining about a one o'clock curfew, shut up. Um, and so I walk in to my door and my mom and dad greet me and they go, Justin, we have to tell you something. I'm like, what, what is it? You know, I'm just, I'm like, they don't even know that me and Amber broke up. They don't know I have a rash right now. And I'm like, what, 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 right? And then they're like, um, your dog Frosty died. Now, Frosty, let me, let me explain the significance of my dog, Frosty. Frosty was a white German shepherd, and Frosty was my only friend for about four years. I am not exaggerating that. Like, it was me and my dog, and that was it. And there's a reason, because I was a weird kid, right? And so, like, I walk in, and he's like, your, your dog, Frosty, is dead. And I'm like, where's my dog, Dad? Where's my dog? And he's like, he's not here. And I'm like, what do you mean my dog's not here? Where's my dead dog, Frosty, right? And my dad goes, well, me and one of my friends, Mike, threw Frosty in the back of our truck, and we threw him in a ditch in the country. And I'm like, dude, this guy, right? I'm like, you just acted like the drug cartel in Mexico and took him, my dog, my best friend, and threw him in a ditch, right? And I'm like, I'm done. You know, I just, I say, okay, okay, dad, cool, cool, dad. You know, tears are running down my real cool. You know, Frosty deserved better. He deserved, he was a good dog, he deserved better. Then I walked back to my room, I put Garth Brooks the dance on and I just pout for about two days. I had just listening to the dance, you know, just for two days. Um, I could sing that song still. And listen, I can talk about this now. I can have a lot of fun with it. It's hilarious, my rash went away, I'm good. I've never been on a horse again. Um, but when you're in the middle of it, it's something else. Right, when you're, when you're in the middle of heartbreak, when you're in the middle of a hard time, it's something else. Um, it, it's not so easy to laugh about. I can look at it, you know, decades later and think it's hilarious, but when I was in going through the process of the heartbreak and the hard time and not understanding everything, it was really, really difficult for me. And James chapter one, verse two through four says this, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. James is telling us that whether we like it or not, no matter how well we want to insulate our life, troubles at some point, trials at some point are going to come your way and come my way. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. James is saying, stop trying to get out of it as fast as you can and let God do his work in you. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And here's what I have learned of going through trials, going through hard times, of losing my job, is that when things go wrong, God is still right. Right, when things go wrong, God is still right. John 16, says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Can I tell you, when things go wrong, it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. That's just life. And so many times we, we think that trials equal God being absent, and that is, can be anything further from the truth. In fact, in most of my experiences and most of the times I've gone through the hard times, when I've gone through the heartbreaks, when I've gone through pain, that's when I feel God the most. And so many times we think, oh, well, God's, God's left me, God's abandoned me, I've done something wrong, or God's not, this isn't fair, right? And fair has nothing to do with any of it. When things go wrong, can I tell you, God is still right. 
And just because your situation has changed does not mean God's character has. Just because things go wrong, can I tell you God's still good? Just because things have gone off the rails, God is still good and God is still faithful and he has a purpose in your pain. And the question tonight is this, is how will you deal with it? In the middle of college, can I tell you my heart, the hardest season by far for me spiritually in my walk was when I was at Bible college. Because I was so force fed and I was so force fed and I had to be, we had to be at chapel every day. And our chapels weren't like ORU's chapels where you guys got good chapels. Ours sucked, right? Like it was like there, it was professor speaking. And I'm like, there's a reason I don't go to your class already. Um, Cause I don't like hearing you in class. You're no better on stage, right? I'm just like, this is horrible. Worship stunk. I mean, it's just bad. And then we had dorm divas. We were required to go to Sunday morning, Sunday. I mean, we went to church like over seven times a week. And I was so force fed and I was so done that I had such a struggle with it and it had to become my own. And at some point, when you're going through the pain, when you're going through the heartache, when you're going through the trial, at some point, your faith, your walk with the Lord, it's got to become your own. And here's what happens. If you don't establish that before the pain, before the trials comes, what happens is the moment things go wrong, you leave. You walk away. Because we say things like this, well, if God was so loving, why would he let something like this happen? Right? And, and the reality is it's because we live in a broken, fallen world that bad things happen. The only time there's not going to be bad present is when we are in heaven, right? Is when we're in a new heaven and a new earth. Bad is part of a fallen world that you can't escape and that I can't escape. People passing away is a reality that you can't escape and I can't escape. Bad things going, compromise happening, it's going to happen no matter what we do. And the question is, what are you going to do? How are you gonna handle when things go wrong? Because many times when things go wrong, we walk away. And there's a story in the New Testament that, that messes with me and I have a really hard time with, and it's found in Mark chapter five, verse 21 through 31, then we're gonna jump to verse 35 through 36, and it really is a story about two people, and it says this, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. This is the famous story we know, right? The woman with the issue of blood. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet in skidding, and yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. And he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me. Like, people are like, Jesus, don't be stupid, right? Like, come on. Like, we're, everybody's touching you, and you're going to ask who's the one person touching me right now. But while Jesus was speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. They said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid just believe. Most of the time we pay attention in this passage to the woman with the issue of blood, but my mind always goes to Jairus. Jairus gets to the place because he knows the only hope for his daughter is a miracle and the Messiah is coming this way. And he's waiting for Jesus to get to the boat. Imagine that you don't know the end of the story, right? Imagine you don't know that Jairus' daughter comes back to life and Jesus whispers, you know, get up, you're fine, let's go. You know, imagine you don't know that part. 
And Jarius is there and he gets there in time. His daughter's still alive. There's still a window of opportunity. There's still a chance. And he gets the attention of the savior, of the master, of the teacher, whatever you want to call him, Jesus. And he convinces him to come to his house so his daughter can live. And they're on his way. And if I'm Jairus, I'm like pulling Jesus, right? He's probably not pulling Jesus because Jesus is an important person. But I'm like, come on, come on, let's way. Let's go faster. Let's go faster, right? And haven't you done that? You know what Jesus is capable of doing? You know what God is capable of doing, but you just want him to do it faster, right? So many times, it's not that I have a problem with God's way, it's his timing that I have a really problem with, a big problem with, right? Like, I'm just like, God, if you could just get here quicker, if you could just do this faster, because what I'm praying for isn't a bad thing, right? What Jairus was praying for wasn't a bad thing, it was a great thing. And he's got Jesus, and Jesus is on his way. And in the midst of almost being to the house, a woman touches his cloak. Awesome miracle happens in this woman's life. A woman who needed a miracle, right? Who has been waiting and spent all she had. Awesome story, awesome miracle. But in the midst of being delayed, Jairus' daughter dies. And in that moment, Jairus doesn't know his daughter's gonna be brought back to life from Jesus. All he knows is the reality that he lost his little girl. And he got there in time. He got there in enough time that there should have been an opportunity for a miracle to happen, but the miracle never, well, it did come about, but not in that time frame. And somebody comes up to him, and they, it's, a, it's a nameless person in the Bible and says one of the most raw, real things. They said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher any more? Why bother with Jesus any more? And maybe some of you, that's where you're at. Maybe you're here tonight and you prayed and your prayers didn't get answered. Maybe you're here and you're dealt with pain after pain after pain and the prayers you've prayed, the good prayers. I mean, there's nothing evil about your prayers. There's nothing evil about what you're wanting, but they never got answered. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, why even bother? Why even bother with this whole following Jesus thing? Why even bother the teacher anymore? You tried everything you could, but your parents still got divorced. Why bother? You're surrounded by people, but you still feel alone, so why even bother? You got hurt, you got wounded, and you've asked Jesus to help, but nothing seems to help, so why bother following the teacher anymore? You struggle with depression, you struggle with addiction, and you want to get better, but nothing seems to get better, so why bother with this whole following Jesus anymore? People that no better talked about you. People that shouldn't have gossiped about you. People that you thought would never leave you out, left you out. So why bother? Why bother with this whole following Jesus thing? You've asked Jesus for a good thing, but it's an unanswered thing. And if he's not gonna answer me, then why would I even bother? And here's what I have learned when you're dealing with pain and when you're at this point, you gotta learn to lean in instead of pushing away. You gotta learn to lean in instead of pushing away. You gotta learn to lean into your savior. You gotta learn to not lean into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him so he can direct your path. You can't lean into your emotions. You can't lean on how you feel, but you gotta keep leaning into what you know. And what you know is he can be trusted. What you know is just because your situation changes doesn't mean that God changes. He's still a good God, even though you have feelings and you've got a thought, why even bother with this? Because what I can tell you is this, pain that isn't transformed is transferred. Pain that isn't transformed is transferred. It's transferred into something else. And some of you, you have been dealing with pain and because you pushed away, you never got, that pain never got transformed into something and it just got transferred into you being angry. It got into you becoming bitter. It became you becoming paranoid and suspicious and not trusting anybody because you've been hurt before. 
It's been you keeping people here, you keeping a relationship here, because if I can keep my expectations, if I can keep people here, if I can keep you know, my, my relationships here, then I won't be hurt near as much. Even your prayer life is here. Why? Because your pain got transferred into something because it never got transformed into what he wanted to do in you. I've shared this story maybe one time before. Um, I'm gonna ask if uh, our, our guy playing the piano, I totally forgot your name, I suck, I'm sorry. Um, if you can come on up. Um, I, I, I really all day struggled whether I was gonna share this story or not. Because I absolutely hate being this transparent. And I'm a pretty transparent person. Um, I don't even think my daughter's heard me share this story. Um, but my mom was a crazy woman. Um, there's a picture that I have of, of, of me, my mom, and my sister. Um, and it looks something like this. And this is one of those church albums. And here's my problem with this picture. I'm not even looking at the freaking camera and they ordered this picture, right? Like my mom and my sister are looking at the camera and they're like, everybody looks good. Let's order the picture. I'm like, I don't look good. I'm not even, I'm not even looking at the camera, right? Um, but this is my mom, um, this is my sister. Um, and my mom was crazy. She was one of those moms that got kicked out of basketball games, got in your face, chased me down the street if I was late for curfew, um, thought I was gonna get a girl pregnant just by looking at her. Um, my mom was over the top, but she was my mom. And my mom in about 2005 was diagnosed with a kidney problem and as a result had to go on dialysis. And when she had to go on dialysis, she didn't really take care of herself and it led to other problems because she didn't buckle down on her diet, because she didn't buckle down on what she needed to do, it led to heart issues. And her heart issues led to her having strokes. And her strokes led to her following and breaking her hip. And all this started just, her health started declining and declining and declining. And the woman that was my mom in 2004 wasn't my mom in 2005 after all these health issues started happening. And because my mom didn't take care of herself, if I was just to be really honest, and I haven't been this honest when I've told this, I got mad. I got really angry at my mom. I got really angry at the Lord. Because here's the problem. I was praying a good prayer. Right? I, I, was, I was praying a great prayer for my mom to receive a miracle because she had an audience. I was praying. Our church was praying. My wife was praying. My sister and brother-in-law, Jaden, who's up here, um, that's my nephew, his mom and dad were praying. Their church was praying, and there were all these people that were praying, and yet, if I'm just to be honest with you, I got angrier and angrier at her because if she wasn't gonna take better care of herself, why should I care? She could have tried harder. And so, as a result, I kept my mom at a distance. Um, I, I didn't want to take care of my mom. I didn't want to help with my mom. My dad had to go out of town. I was like, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy. We're starting a church. We got all these things going on. And December 6, 2010, my mom walked in to do dialysis. And one of her heart valves, when she walked in, absolutely exploded. She fell to the ground. Her body's in shock. They rush her to the ER and they find out that they're going to have to do open heart surgery if my mom's going to survive. My mom is 57 years old. And I look at my dad, I, I, I drove from Tulsa to Oklahoma City and I go, dad, there's no, there's no way. My, my mom's not gonna, she can't survive the surgery. And my dad's like, well, we gotta try. I'm like, dad, there's no way. On December 9th, 2010, we're in the ICU and I, I, I can still see my mom in her bed. I can still see all the tubes. I can still see all the monitors and the nurse comes in and says, your mom's about to go at any moment.
beep started getting slower, slower. My dad's on my left. My sister's on my left. I'm on the other side of the bed. And the line just goes straight. (laughs) And in that moment, when that line went straight, I just said, I just lost. I just lost my mom. And I just laid on her bed and I cried. And what I still struggle with is this. It's, yeah, I miss my mom, but I miss what should have been. My, My daughters never really knew my mom. My mom should have been at Charlie's FFA shows and bugging Charlie while she's trying to show her sheep and freaking the sheep out, right? And the sheep's running all over the place and my daughter yelling at Nana, stop, you're freaking the sheep out. She never got that chance. My mom should have been getting teased while my youngest daughter's playing basketball with Jinx basketball and getting thrown out of the gym with me, right? My, my, my mom and my daughter never got that chance. My mom never saw Foundation Church at this stage. They never saw Foundation Church at the last stage. She only saw Foundation Church at the beginning stage while we were at a school. My mom should have been at my daughter's graduation. My mom should be when my daughters get married. My mom should be at a lot of places and it was a good prayer. And some of you, you prayed good things. And you're sitting there going, why, why even bother? Why, why, my parents still got divorced, why bother? Seems like none of my prayers get answered, so why bother? So here's what I did, I just stayed busy. Because if I could stay busy, I wouldn't have to deal with the pain. Right, I remember I worked on the day of my mom's viewing, so I didn't have to deal with the reality of losing my mom. I preached that Sunday morning, and then I drove down to Oklahoma City just so I didn't have to be around that much. I don't talk about it that much because if I can just stay busy enough, if I can just be successful enough, then maybe it makes the pain go away. And about five years ago, I came across this passage of Scripture out of the message. I never read out of the message, but it says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what's most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. Listen to me. As long as you're pushing away instead of leaning in, your pain's not getting dealt with. It's not getting transformed. It's just getting transferred. And the only way you can deal with your pain in a healthy manner is not to push Jesus away. It isn't to have an attitude of why bother the teacher anymore, but if you feel like you've lost what's most dear to you, hear me, you're at such a great place right now. And I know that sounds weird. I know that sounds like, what? But you're now at a place you can be embraced by the one most dear to you. There's a psalm that echoes this, and it's found in Psalm 34, 18, and it says, the Lord is close to the broken and hearted and he rescued the, rescues those whose spirits are crushed. It says this in the CEV, the Lord is there to rescue all who are discouraged and have given up hope. And if that's you tonight, I wanna echo the words to you that Jesus said to Jairus. He simply said, don't be afraid. Simply believe. And tonight, all you gotta do, don't push him away. Let yourself be embraced by the one most dear to you and believe. You know what? He's still a good God. You know what? He's still got my best in mind. At the forefront of his heart, he still loves me the most. Can we bow our heads? God will come before you tonight.
I'm gonna ask the prayer team if you guys would come down just right now as Lord, we come before you, and God, it's really easy just to mask the pain, to mask the hurt, to mask the disappointment. Lord, the doubt. But Lord, as long as we're transferring pain, nothing's getting fixed, I pray that there would be a transformation that happens in this place tonight. Lord, there would be a real work that you do in our heart that we would just allow ourselves for a moment to be embraced by the one most dear to us. The Lord, we just simply believe. Believe that you're still good. And we lean into you rather than push away. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you would be near to the broken and hearted. And those here tonight that their spirit's crushed, oh, they're so disappointed. God, they're so frustrated. God, pray, man, do a work in their life. Do a work in the heart.